Hi everyone, Sharon Schenk here from H Los Angeles. How are you doing? It is a sweltering day here in the city of Los Angeles. I hope that your weather is shining down on you bright. So tonight's topic is going to be no more excuses, stop the blame. So you will be marveled to realize it's a massively Jewish concept and we're gonna delve into it now. Why did I wanna talk about this? As an associate marriage and family therapist, I had a couple in my, well, on Zoom, because we're in the corona time, but let's say in my office, and there is a tremendous amount of contempt that you feel in the room, and there's a major amount of disconnection, and I said to them, you know what, we're going to play a game. It's called the no blame game. It was actually introduced to me by Shani Solomon about 15, 17 years ago, when I had two little children, and the idea was that the kids kept saying, mommy, he smacked me, she whacked me, he said a bad name to me. And it would go on forever. She said, we'll say the no blame game. And it means I'm gonna count to three kids, one, two, three. And when I get to three, at the same time, you're gonna tell me all the things that you did in order to keep the cycle of conflict going. I didn't use those words with my three and four year old at the time. And they're like, okay, we're going to play a game, the no blame game. And I said, one, two, three. And he said, I smashed her in the face. And my Leora said, I smacked him. And it went on and they fell about laughing. But the, the lesson for them was that you always have a part to play in the scenario, in the circumstance, in the upset. So I tried it on my couple. I, I explained to them the game and I said all right guys let's do it one two three go silence obviously because no one wants to step into uh actually let me just take some responsibility here and he says I have nothing to take responsibility for it's all her and she went it's all him and it went on and on and I said come on guys what do you do to keep the cycle going what do you do to keep the conflict in your marriage going? And he says, all right, I'm really good at insulting her. And she said, I know how to push his buttons to the degree that he walks out and slams the door. And he says, and it went on. And they looked at each other and went, wow. And then, but they kept saying, but I only do that because of what he does or she does. Blame is an incredible concept because when you take responsibility, it doesn't break you, it makes you. And blame has been allowed to flourish in the world that we live in today. But it's a Jewish concept that is finest because making excuses and blaming people stop us from being great, from reaching our potential, from being the best us that we can be. It stops us connecting to us, connecting to God, connecting to other people. And we walk around with this baggage and negativity that we attach to that person because they made us have a bad, have a bad day. And we attach to our children because they're driving us bonkers. And we attach to our, our boss because they're making us suffer. And it absolves all of that. It's obviously a primal concept going all the way back to Adam and Eve. That God gives them, puts them in the Garden of Eden and he says, Adam, Eve, you can go and enjoy and the pleasures of the Garden of Eve, Eden, but there's one rule, just one. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge. They're like, yeah, sure, no problem. They go out on their merry way and the snake comes along and entices Eve to eat from the tree. And then she entices her husband, Adam, to eat from the tree. God comes along and he says, hey, what's going on? And she says, oh, it was the, it was the snake. The serpent enticed me. And then, um, and then he says, well, because of the woman God that you gave me. So she blamed the snake and he blamed God. And they were frowned upon. So it wasn't a result, according to Adam, it wasn't a result of their choices. It was because it was God's fault or it was the snake's fault. And she says, the snake deceived me. So Adam and Eve were punished because, not because they just didn't listen to God, but, but for blaming. And I saw actually this week, very cool, happened to be 
last week's um, Torah portion, which is called Shemini. I just read you um, an excerpt. This is an awesome book it's called Reachings by Yaakov Haber. And it says here two stories. Um, Aaron, not going to tell you the stories, but Aaron in the first and the people, the Jewish people in the second, each take the blame for the fa their failure. And Moses then gives credit for their ultimate success to Aaron. So it's such a different worldview today. We see the story of Adam and Eve. They were told off because they blamed someone else. And then we see the story of Aaron and Moses who were praised because they took responsibility and they didn't blame someone else for a, a mistake or something that happened. So that's what we're going to do today. Blame is the mind's way of avoiding responsibility for our actions and our feelings. And if it goes unchecked, and here's the thing, and I think you may identify with this, blame can grow into such enormous portions that we convince ourselves that we're always the victims in it. And we get locked into the beliefs that, that we're the victim and, and I can't do anything about it and I have no role to play. And that's really disempowering. And as I said at the beginning, blame's an important concept because when we blame other people, we don't take responsibility. We're not choosing greatness. We're not choosing to work on a character trait. We're not choosing to make a plan or step up. We're just choosing to absolve all responsibility from myself and put it on someone else. And it leads us to a feeling of real utter helplessness. So, we blame also much more than we think. The whole world that we live in, and I realized when I started thinking about it, how much I blame, you know, the five pounds I put on during Corona because of coronavirus, not because of my choices, of course not. We blame the computer games for our kids putting on weight. We blame the parking, uh, the slow person behind the counter for a reason that we got a ticket on the car. We, we blame the traffic for being late to a meeting. We blame our husbands or our wives or people we're in relationships with because we have a hectic and hard day. It's their fault because of what they did, what they said, how they upset us. We blame sick people or sick people blame the medication that the doctor gave us that was wrong. We blame the doctors for doing an inadequate job and that's why I feel so bad, all my aches and pains the person at the counter for being slow, which is why I was late for a meeting. Daytime television is literally endless examples, <laughs> definitely uh, some shows, they're endless examples of people showing how to blame everyone else for their upset. So there's, there was even in 2008, there was a time special, remember when the market crashed, there was a special or a time special all about who was to blame, who were the people to blame for the, the financial downfall, the financial crisis. And as today, I mean, the world of politics is all about blaming someone else rather than working together and coming up with a plan how to make it right. With our children, um, blame's been allowed to flourish because we've all been brought up blaming. You, you, you smack your head on the table, you say, naughty table, your mother comes along and says, oh, naughty table, not, maybe you should not run and you should slow down and walk rather than run, you won't smack your head, but naughty table, you, you trip over the rug, naughty rug, rather than what can I do to stop smacking into the wall? So rather than take responsibility, we sue. We live in this world where, sorry if you're a lawyer but we're making lawyers rich and we're taking no responsibility ourselves and to be a Jew is all about taking responsibility I found a few articles that were fascinating of people not taking responsibility or rather of people suing and I'll leave it to you so one of them so this mother sued Nutella so it said that the advertisement says that all the ingredients in Nutella are healthy and nutritious. And her four-year-old kid, she was giving every single day, maybe two out of the three meals a day, she was giving her kid Nutella in a sandwich because 
Nutella, which is a chocolate spread, is healthy and nutritious. And she settled for three million for a class action law, uh, a class action case, because she accused them of false promotion. Okay, number two, we have this kid was suing their, his university because in his final year, he got caught for cheating and he got expelled. So why was he suing the university? He sued them for not catching him sooner. Can you believe that? And then we've got this Liebeck Bees um, versus McDonald's. Someone bought a coffee in McDonald's and they drove away and the coffee was too hot and they had it um, clasped in between their, their legs, their thighs, and it spilt on their inner thigh and it burnt them. It was a terrible thing. They got burnt and it was bad and they spent time in hospital, but they settled for $640,000 because the coffee was too hot. So the guidelines is everything today, even Lysol, um, which we're living with now, it says on Lysol, keep out of reach of children. And it talks about make sure your dogs, your domestic animals, hazards to humans, your coffee cups say caution, contents may be hot. A packet of nuts today says caution, may contain nuts. So we have to be so careful because the culture and the environment that we are living in is one where you don't have to take responsibility, honey. Look, they did wrong. They didn't write that there was nuts on a nut package. Now you can sue them if you have a, if you have a problem. So I'll show you how also I, I wrote this, how it's been able to come into all of our conversations, blame. And you won't believe how common it is. So I wrote, a, this is a very short play. Instead of having you read it, I'm going to be three people. There's two kids, a mum, and follow with me. So it's just before Friday night dinner. And the mum's picking the kids up from school late. So kid says, mum, where have you been? You're late. And the mum says, sorry, kid. There was so much traffic. The other kid says, because of you, mom, I'm not going to get my homework done in time. The mother says, can you guys just get in your car and fasten the seatbelts? Because you're so slow. Come on. I need to get home and hurry up and take the chicken out of the oven before it burns. You're literally burning my chicken. And she's honking the drivers in front of her. You're burning my chicken. Come on, traffic lights. Turn. She calls her husband just in case to say, hubby. Can you turn the oven off for me? He's meant to be home from work at this point. And he, he says he's not home yet. And the mum says, because of you, my dinner is ruined because you're not where you're meant to be. And the dad says, oh, no. Well, there was a customer at work that just wouldn't leave the, the showroom. The kid says, mum, you're making me spill my drink. Can you slow down? And the second kid says, stop whining. You're giving me a headache regular conversation that happens in a regular family. I wrote it every single sentence that anyone said involved blame. It's a concept that really when you become bar mitzvah, uh, the kids become bar and bat mitzvah, that's when they take responsibility for themselves and the entire Jewish people. Um, and when they're told that it makes you, it doesn't break you, it will improve your children's and yourself, it improves their confidence, their popularity, their interaction with others. When you just step up and take responsibility, make a plan to change and grow. So also uh, with parenting, our job as parents is to make sure that we're creating that safe environment for our kids where they're able to say, oh yeah, I actually did this. An example could be, where's, where's that sweatshirt? that I bought you that new sweatshirt. You've just walked in the door. Where is it? And the kid, because he's scared of the consequence of being told off, is going to lie. So you have to make a, a safe environment where, oh, honey, did you enjoy the sweater today? I, you, I can't see it. Did you leave it at school? Gives them an opening to say, yeah, I left it in school, rather than someone took it. So I saw an awesome quote. This quote is by a, the founder of the self-help movement. Her name is Louise Hay. 
And listen to this. Blame is one of the surest ways to stay in a problem. In blaming another, we give away our power. The alternative to blaming is accepting responsibility for our own experience and select thoughts that empower us, not disempower us. So I'm gonna ask you to think about this. Why do we blame? What are the reasons? I have a whole list. I'd love to be able to hear from you. I'm gonna tell you what I came up with and let's see if this is the same as yours. So one of the reasons we blame is because being right is really pleasurable. We don't wanna be wrong. We wanna be right. So we're gonna blame someone else. It's much easier, much more convenient to be right. Far less embarrassing if you've done the wrong thing. And so we blame someone else or something else or the event or the circumstances rather than take responsibility. Uh, I'm just checking the time, folks. Okay. So another reason is because we all have a, a bit of a messed up and distorted self-image of ourselves and we base how we feel about ourselves, our self-esteem, often we base it on external opinion on what other people think of us. So I'm gonna blame something or someone else because I wanna make sure that in your eyes, I'm perfect. I don't wanna be tainted. And I'm gonna blame other people for my mistakes. Another reason we blame is because it's a great attention grabber. So I call up my friend and I go, da, 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 this is what they did to me. What's their reaction gonna be? Oh my goodness, no way. That's what happens? <gasps> and it's a really good attention grabber rather than, and it, 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 you put yourself into a place of victim that someone else or something else has imposed their, that upset upon you rather than you having anything to do with it. We also blame because it relieves us of responsibility. You were meant to do something at work and rather than say, oops, I didn't get it done and you're meant to be part of the team and do your job, you'll say, well, this person never told me to do it or they never told me that it was done to be done for today, which leads you to lying as well. Fear of change is another reason why we blame. I don't wanna have to change. Like I can't be bothered to do that. And I don't wanna be someone else. I'm quite happy with who I am or are you. So it's important to encourage ourselves and our children that you can overcome your character traits. Like we're placed in the situations that we're placed into by Hashem so that we can grow and develop and grab our inner strength and just shine from those situations. We also, it compensates for our own inadequacies. So we're gonna blame, it diverts attention away from us. Imagine, just think what life would be like if I didn't walk around blaming others and being negative. So what can we do about it? Why is, it, why is this an important Jewish concept? So we, I heard from Rabbi Niven, he said, he said said that 80% of the negativity that we walk around with in our life is because of blame, is because we're blaming someone else or something else. That's a lot. Imagine all that baggage and all that weight and all that negativity that we walk around our, our lives and our day and we just go hook, hook, and we attach that negativity to people. And it, cause, it causes, um, uh, um, disconnection from in relationships. Another reason is because blaming and negativity, it takes away your vitality and joy in life. We're meant to be joyous and connected people. And it, it, when you're not joyous and connected, it also means you can't connect spiritually either. Also blaming ignores God's role in orchestrating all the events that happen that led you to the situation or to be with the person that led to your upset. He's sending you messages. It's not, it's not for nothing. Be able to open your eyes and recognize the messages 
if they come again and again. And also, it's a Jewish concept because when we blame, we generally lie and we bear a grudge and we lower ourselves and we don't want to do that. We also have a mitzvah in Judaism called Teshuva, which means returning to our great self, our soul, returning to the best version of us. And it's stopping what we're stopping the behavior that's causing us a problem and to stop and regret that what we're doing and say sorry and then make a plan for change. And lastly, have a follow up. So I will talk about that in a second. It also hurts our self esteem when we blame. Because if we never take responsibility, we never give ourselves a, a chance to build our integrity. Our responsibility won't break us. So it's a very different situation. So what can we do? People that blame also feel that they walk around the world and they have no control over how they feel. And they have no control over what they do and how they behave. But the news is that Jewish wisdom says that we, our choices shape the direction of our life. And we're the only people, we're the, I'm the only person that makes my choices that shapes my direction towards right or towards left. Every choice that I make is pleasurable. You know, it's pleasurable to scream at someone and then go and sink into my bedroom. It's also pleasurable to step up and have a difficult conversation because the outcome is a reunited relationship. So what can I do? How can I start taking responsibility? Well, I'll tell you what's not enough. Saying sorry is not enough. I'll tell you why. Because you can say, oh, I'm so sorry I'm late for work. There was traffic. And then the next day, I'm so sorry I was late for work. I didn't do the laundry and I had to do the laundry. I'm so sorry I'm late for work the next day. I got stopped by a police officer. I'm so sorry I'm late for work. I, my alarm didn't go off. And it goes on and on. So why is sorry not enough? Because you can continuously say sorry and never change. And I always hear from women the upset they have of their husbands. They say, sorry, I'm so sorry. But they do the same thing again and again and again. So really taking responsibility, sorry is not enough, but making a plan to change is what's needed. And really that is the mitzvah of teshuva. The mitzvah of teshuva is realizing what you do and stopping it and regretting it and then saying sorry, but making a plan to change and figuring out. And you know what? Sometimes it takes a, a few copies and a few, I, a few additions of the plan and you have to be able to follow up on the plan by looking a week later is this working or is it not i got to get back to the drawing board so making a plan for change is really how we grow that's like 101 of self-growth i have to stop and look at where my blocks are where all the excuses come out and i say i can't do this i can't i can't i can't and then we realize actually maybe i can because hashem believes in me I just got ahead that way. So I, again, hold on. Okay. So I, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, okay, I'll tell you this story. It's a story about Rabbi Klatzkow. It's a story I read in a book. I think it was uh, Rabbi Przansky's book. And the story goes like this. He said it was many, many years ago, and he had just got he was been married a few years and he had a few kids and he his car was just broken down he had a very stable financial situation he didn't have much money at all and he was on a collel stipend and his car broke down he'd saved enough money and he heard in queens that there was going to be this massive car auction happening and you go in you only need a quarter of the amount of money and you come out with an awesome car so him and his wife, they drive down to Queens and he's about to go into this massive um, uh, room, a very large room with a conveyor belt going round and round with cars on them and you bid on each car. And just before he walks in, his wife says, honey, you've got a thousand bucks on you or more. That's a lot of money. 
can't just stick it in your pocket. You're gonna get pickpocketed. He's like, wife, no, it's fine. She said, no, honey, you can't do that. You're gonna get, someone's gonna take your money. He says, all right, just for you. I, I will, uh, I'll put it in my pocket. She says, no, you've got to put it in your shoe. Put it in your shoe, cover it up. No one can take it. He says, I'm not going to walk around with a thousand bucks in my shoe. So she says, honey, someone's going to take it. He says, no, no, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll put it in my pocket. And then he pulls all this tissue out and he puts the tissue on top of the money. And he says, uh, this is okay. Someone puts their hand in my pocket. They're going to take out the tissues. It's fine. He goes in, he bids on the car, he's really happy about it. And all of a sudden someone taps him on the shoulder and he says, uh, excuse me, I think I saw someone like, putting their hand in your pocket. He's like, oh, oh my gosh. And he puts his hand in his pocket and he pulls out the tissues and the rest is empty. The money was taken. And he had this stinking feeling that he had to go back to the wife who said to him, put in your shoe. Someone and she was going to say, I told you so. I told you so. And you didn't listen to me. I told you so. And it was just awful. He went back to his wife without the car. And that was it. She didn't say anything. And they went back in the same broken old car all the way back to where they lived. And the whole journey home was murder for him. Because he was waiting for the four words of his wife saying, I told you so. It didn't come waiting and waiting it was so awful for him he pulled into the drive and she she he turned to her and he said just say it just say I told you so and she turns to him and said honey why would I do that I'm here working on our marriage I want to have a successful marriage I got my goals I got my dreams and saying I told you so and blaming you is they're not helpful those four words I'm not going to do that we're in this together I'm behind you 100%. I support you. Those words aren't going to help us. We're a team. We'll get through this together. And at that moment, he felt, I have to repay this woman for her greatness, her kindness. She's so incredible. She could have blamed me and repeated this moment forevermore in our marriage. But she didn't. She was there to build me and to love me. Years later, it was the last sister in, he has a large family and the younger sister was about to get married. And why was it exciting? You know, when the last child gets married in the family, it's that photo opportunity of all the siblings coming together with the families. So he went and he bought, spent time buying the perfect tie and the perfect cufflinks and the perfect suit and shirt and every. He was really excited. It was a big deal because he wanted to look great in the photos and it's his sister's wedding. So there was going to be many hours drive to get to the wedding and him and his wife were together packing up the kids, getting their clothes ready, the car, um, all the food that was needed for the journey to get to the wedding hall, also for the photos early, everything that they could possibly need. And he'd hung his, his suit into the closet. And the day comes and he's like, OK, honey, have you got the kids clothes? Check. You got the suit? Check. You got the kids? Check. You got the food? Check. You got this? Check, 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 check. They get into the car and they make their many hours journey to get to the wedding home. Just as they arrive, they pull in and they're starting to unload and they get all the kids clothes out first so they could get the kids dressed. And it comes time for them to sort themselves out. And he opens his trunk and he's rummaging through the trunk. And he says, uh, honey, I, I, it, I can't find my suit. Can you come help me? And she comes to the trunk and she's looking through. And she went, oh, I never took it, honey. I left it in the coat closet. I'm so sorry. He'd spent hours looking for the perfect tie with the perfect suit, the perfect shirt, the perfect cufflinks. And he went, he was about to give it to her, blame her for everything. And he said, he remembered the car auction and it was his opportunity. And he turned to her and he said, I'm going to wear what I'm wearing now. I borrow a tie. He was completely creased. He'd just been driving for hours. I borrow a tie and it's going to be great. No problem. I'm so glad I'm, I'm dressed like this anyway. So she was so thankful to him. And a few minutes later, he hears this small commotion, a rustling. 
and he goes and he looks uh, and he sees him in the room. She's gathered all the children, her children, their children together. She's retelling over the story of the car auction and how amazing here the father was and the mother is that they're working together to make an incredible marriage. And she brings them together and she puts her hands over the head and she says, I want to give you all a blessing that you get to become the greatness of your abba, your daddy, your tati, that he understands there's no point in blaming someone else. Our job is figuring out what can I do and how can I respond? Responsible is being, having the ability to respond in the moment she gives. She gives them this amazing blessing that they should have the greatness of their father. And he said he stood there that day and he was looking through the crack of the door and he was listening and watching this happen. And he said he, he, were, he had tears in his eyes. They were dropping down his face. And he realized that that night he would be the best dressed person at the wedding. He went on to have an incredible wedding because it's having the foresight of knowing what my dreams are, what my goals are, and that I'm heading for my potential and my greatness. And the buck stops here. It doesn't stop with the four words, I told you so. It's all about blaming. When you blame, you point your finger. There's always three fingers pointing back at you. So I want to also just finish with a few things that we can do to make sure that we are taking responsibility and not blaming. So as I said, responsible is responsible. It's being able to be in control. You're the only person who makes choices and the choices that you make create the experience of your life. Admit you make a mistake if you made a mistake. Accept you're the only one to blame if you have a bad day. And if, you, if you're late, maybe you should have left earlier for the appointment. Be open to the opinions and others and influence of other people. And know that I define myself by my choices, not by what happens in the rest of the world. Communication skills, there's obviously the you versus the I. When you say you, you're blaming. When you say I feel, then you're just expressing how you feel. And you're, you're expressing your opinion and your feelings. Avoid the, the extravagant, you always or you, you never, because it's just not true. And parents should never say, you made me do that. You know, you're so naughty. You made me act this way. You made me hit you. You made me scream at you. Because if a kid breaks a window and, and the parent says, you're the most irresponsible, reckless kid, and I, I can't let you go outside. The kid's going to have to take whatever blame you dish out because they don't know any better. So in a relationship, instead of making the other partner be responsible for your experience of your life, just remember that you've got to do it for yourself, through your thoughts and your actions and taking responsibility, making that plan for change, stepping up. And that's the greatness of all of us. All right. So no more excuses. Stop blaming and take responsibility. Bye for